What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you the full story of Divine Divinity. So, Divine Divinity is the very first game in the Divinity series, it came out in 2002, and as you can obviously see right off the bat, it's a little dated, right? So, it's a pretty old game. Getting it to work on modern hardware can be a bit of a pain. The first thing you'll notice is the menu. If you ever see that, like, that's not scalable. That's just how the menu is. There's nothing wrong with the game. It's just that's how it looks on modern systems because where the game's old. We're going to start with the intro cinematic to the game. Obviously, since this is the full story, we'll start there. The intro cinematic tells us one important fact. It's that the canonical player in this game is the male warrior. Now, when you hit new game, you actually have a choice between a survivor, a warrior, or a mage, and male or female versions of all of those. Now, the main difference that you're going to pick with those is that each uh, of the survivor, warrior, and the mage, they each have a special attack, which is your right mouse button by default. Besides that, uh, pretty much everybody can do everything otherwise. Um, it affects your starting stats like a little, but that's about it. For the most part, the main thing is who gets what special attack. The survivor gets to sneak, the warrior has like a, a swirl attack, and the mage has, uh, I think it's like a bolt or something like that. So uh, I picked survivor just because it's easier for me to play that way, but the canonical character for the game is the male warrior. From this cinematic, the cat goes back, apparently, and tells its master that it found somebody in the woods, or at least leads its master to him. And we wake up in somebody's basement. Uh, once we're done getting our bearings, we can head upstairs and we'll have this conversation. Ah, my friend. You're awake at last. How are you feeling? You're in my house in Alaroth, a small community of healers. In normal times, this place would be bustling with activity, but things have been rather quiet due to the recent troubles. You mean apart from the orc bandits infesting the woods and the fact that we've lost contact with the source? Well, our leader, Mardanius by name, seems to have gone, how should I put it? Well, uh, he seems to have gone as crazy as a loon. Yes, that's the only way to put it. He's constantly raving about dark chambers and evil spirits, and he thinks everybody is a servant of the dark powers. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he's been possessed by a demon. Of course, uh, that can't be true. Nobody has gone down with possession in, in centuries. Well, that's good of you, my friend. And I don't want to sound rude, but we are, after all, professional healers. If we can't help him, I doubt a simple adventurer could do better. And then again, so far all our efforts of curing him have failed, and the man is in constant mental pain. Maybe strange illnesses must be cured by strange methods. Follow the street outside my house, a little bit to the south, 
and then go west. His house is next to the old well. Uh, before you go, I couldn't carry your belongings with me when I brought you here. Feel free to take anything you find necessary from my house. We healers believe in sharing what we have with the needy. Oh, you're very welcome. You can always repay me later, if you feel in my debt. Perhaps you should pay George a visit. He has a small shop and could provide you with some basic gear for a reasonable price. But I'm sure an adventurer like yourself will find ways of making enough money, even here in poor Alaroth. He lives in the southeast of the village, near the gate. Now the main thing we learned from this conversation is that the town's leader, Mardanus, has gone a little crazy here in the past couple days. We ask if we could help with that. And it goes from there, and then as we take what we need from his house and then step outside, we can see a conversation with Mardanus taking place. Mardanius, my poor old friend. What are you doing outside? What? Oh, oh, oh. it's you, Lanilo. I, I was... Ah, oh, he will come! The end is upon us! Shiloi! You're raving, Mardanius. You must take more rest. Come, let me take you home. But Nemesis is near! We must be vigilant! We must be pure! We must um, behave! Oh! What did you say, Lanilo? Rest? Oh, yes, I could try to sleep. If only the voice in my head would be silent. Now from here, we're free to explore town, the town, and when we're ready, then we go and see Mardanus. Now, obviously what you want to do here is go around town, pick up what you need, but there's also a couple of quests you can pick up in town as far as side quests go. Uh... Most of them are unimportant. We're mostly going to stick to the main story here, but the main things I want to mention is that you can find out that there's a plague in Rivertown and that the town you're in, Alaroth, the healers, which it's a big healer town, so where most of the healers live is in Alaroth, it is need, all the healers are needed in Rivertown where there is a plague going on. And then also if we try to leave out the front gate, uh, we get stopped by a soldier who says that there's a bunch of orcs and everything, and we should probably stay inside. Now, you can technically leave right here. Like, there's nothing stopping you from staying in town, but the main story kind of leads you through this town first, just to kind of get leveled up. So that's where we're going to start with helping Mardanus, because it's important later that we do that. After we've learned all those things and we are ready to move on, uh, we can go to Mardanus' house, which is in the southwest corner over here, and we see this conversation unfold. Oh, dear me. Come, Mardanius, I'll feed you the medicine myself. Doom and destruction! What? You! Oh, Thelion Hashnitor, the Lord of Decay! Oh, be gone, foul demon! No, no, it's me, Lanilor. Oh, come, let me make you some more of that hot tea. I will not drink your foul brew, Thelion. Do you really think you can fool me? <laughs> Taste my power! No, Mardanius, no! I am Lanilor! Now, since this guy is frozen, obviously we need to help him out. Uh, the door is locked to Mordanus's house now, but if we speak to the guy who's frozen, he tells us that there is another route through the well. So if we go over here to the well, drop down, we can then use that to get into Mardanus's house. And after a conversation with Mardanus, we convince him that uh, Lanalore is not a demon and that he should unfreeze him. So once that's done, we learn that Mardanus went down to the catacombs recently and is been going crazy since then. So he gives us a hint about how to get down to the catacombs, which all we really have to do is go over to the shrine in the middle of town. 
and click on the four dragon statues until they're all facing north and then the statue in the middle will shoot up and you'll be able to drop down into the catacombs. Now the catacombs consist of five levels. Uh, this is where the combat actually starts in the game really. So there's mostly just skeletons which are pretty easy to kill however you will start running into some other enemies like skeleton guardians which are giant skeletons and the occasional skeleton conjurer which just spawns more you know skeletons and then just some harder variations as well you will run into some orcs down here that are after a specific axe if you find that axe and give it back that'll give you some quest experience it's just a quick side quest it doesn't really have any implications later in the game so from there, we of course plumb these catacombs, we get down to the bottom, finally, and we find out that what's going on is that a mage, and we should have picked up some notes and things that would be telling us about this as we're going down, a mage named Thelrion has basically been down here, this is where he got entombed, and all of these skeletons are trying to resurrect him because that was Thelrion's last directive to his minions because all of these skeletons are his minions. He made them, which again is something we'll learn as we're plumbing the catacombs. And the reason they can't resurrect him is that one of the skeletons in charge of something important has died. So if we go over and take that skeleton's place, the skeletons will resurrect him and then this conversation happens. At last, I have returned from the lands of the dead. I have become immortal. Our master has returned. Oh, master, finally you are with us once again. Oh, my sweet minions. I knew you could bring me back. Thelrion wasn't aware that being an undead lich apparently was pretty painful, so he asked you to kill him. So you have to do that to restore Mardanus' sanity, so I recommend you do it. Otherwise you'll have to come back and do it later, honestly, because Mardanus is important. Little spoiler warning. So go ahead and kill him, and then the room floods with skeleton minions who are mad you just killed their master. So as you can see, just from the sheer number of skeletons here, this fight is impossible. You want to run out the north entrance that we came in through, and you'll be portaled out by Mordanus. Fantastic. So he thanks you for restoring his sanity and everything, which is nice. And if you tell him about the fact that Rivertown has a plague, which you can learn from the guy at the gate when you tried to step out, if you inform Mardanus of this plague, uh, he will tell you that you need to go down to the army barracks south of the Dukedom of Feral. Basically secure them a military escort because the woods are crawling with orcs. So that kind of becomes our next objective. However, once we actually step down through the path here and go down, we get interrupted by a dragon rider. Now. These guys ride pretty small dragons. You'll see several dragon riders throughout the game. Um, these are not like full-grown dragons. They get much bigger than this. They are not dragon knights. That's also important to remember is that these guys are dragon riders, not dragon knights. Dragon knights are a very separate thing. 
So he'll have this conversation, but then he gets interrupted by Zandalore. So some of you guys rem- might remember Zandalore from Divinity Original Sin, but this is the first time you would see him in the series, obviously, if this is the one you were playing. And Zandalore interrupts the Dragon Rider, uh, heals you after the Dragon Rider attacked you, and basically explains that the thing that hit you in the woods was a divine being and that you are one of the marked ones. And he asks you to meet him and the other marked ones down at the Dwarven Bread Inn. So, in addition to stopping by the army barracks to secure a transport for Mardanus's healers, we also need to now head to the Dwarven Bread Inn. So I think that's where we're going to wrap up part one of this full story here. And I think we'll pick up next with just at the Dwarven Bread Inn, probably. I hope you guys liked it. Uh, This is the first episode, obviously, but it's the full story of Divine Divinity. So like, comment, subscribe if you're looking forward to more. And thank you so much for watching. What's going on, everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you part two of the full story of Divine Divinity. Now, if you missed the first part, you might want to start there. But also, uh, there's a link down below for the full Divinity series timeline if you're interested in checking that out. So where we left it off was we had to go to the Dwarven Bread Inn to meet Zandalar with the other Marked Ones. Before we do that, we need to stop by the barracks and tell Commander Alex that there is healers in Alaroth who need a escort to Rivertown so they can help with the plague there. Uh, That is important for later in the game, so you do actually need to stop and do that as well, even though it is technically kind of a side thing. It does need to get done. So after stopping by and telling her this, we can head over to the Dwarven Bread Inn. Now after looking around for a little bit, we can find one of the Marked Ones, and we can have a short conversation with him, essentially talking about uh, where Zandalore and the other Marked One are. And this marked one ensures you that Zandalore has went off to Stormfist Castle, which is the home of the late Duke Farrell, that he requested that you guys wait here. So rather than wait there, you decide to go to Stormfist Castle to look for Zandalore. Here's where it gets a little tricky, because you can't just enter Stormfist Castle. You actually need an invitation. So this is the first of what I would call a bit of a time gate that the game gives you, where you have to achieve something by pretty much stopping and doing side quest. Now there's a couple different ways you can get a invitation to Stormfist Castle, uh, but it pretty much all just involves side quests and stuff, and you only really need to complete the one chain. Of the couple options you are presented that will actually lead you to a invitation. So, using the magic of videos, we're going to go ahead and skip that part because we're worried about the main story and not all these side quests. And we're going to jump to Stormfist Castle. So after you've successfully secured a invitation by hunting down a side quest chain that you don't necessarily have to do per se, we can enter Stormfist Castle at the request of the current Duke, Janus. Now, before we go any further, I want to explain a couple things. While you're out doing these side quests, what you're likely to find out about is that the old Duke, Duke Farrell, died. He was assassinated, actually, by the Assassin's Guild, which you can find out. It's kind of obvious, by the way, so it's not even really a spoiler. Like, as soon as you hear about it, you're like, oh, that guy definitely got murdered. So... You find out that this happened to the Duke, and that his 12-year-old son took over as the new Duke, which is very suspicious. He has a brand new advisor, who is also very suspicious. So there was no real attempt to be subtle here, like something's clearly off. So besides something being off, uh, Duke Farrell actually also had a prophecy before his death that a new divine would rise after he died. Obviously, very scant details on who the divine one actually was, but, you know, blessed by the seven gods, all that jazz, there would be a new divine is essentially what the prophecy came down to, and it had a couple particular details about the reveal. So, then we go to meet Duke Janus after finding all this out through side quests and getting our invitation, and Janus decides to appoint us as his lord protector. The thing is, it seems that he mostly just wants you to do chores around the castle. So after this happening and getting yelled at by him and his suspicious advisor, you have to do a couple odd jobs around the castle. None of them are really important, but you do have to get them done. 
it pretty much just involves fetching things for his girlfriend and that's pretty much it like you have to bring her flowers you have to bring her a poem you have to find her lost teddy bear like it's it's a whole thing Now, in between these little mundane tasks, there are a couple of interruptions at the court. And these interruptions at the court basically kind of explain that Duke Janus is kind of intentionally starting, well, provoking wars between people. Uh, The elves come in and request help as the dwarves have been moving to attack them recently by stealing their artifacts and things. And instead of trying to handle that justly, Duke Janus sides with the dwarves entirely and basically kind of intentionally tries to set off a war with these elves. Janus uses the fact that the dwarves successfully repelled the first chaos invasion by themselves and kind of uses that as justification for this. And then a second interruption we can have, and the last one really, after we do all the tasks, shows Duke Janus being declared the Divine One by the Church of the Seven Gods. This is the part where we realize that the reason Duke Janus appointed us as his Lord Protector was to fulfill his father's prophecy. So, uh, as you can see from some of the wording here that you can read, him being here as well as with his Lord Protector at his side and this advisor on his right side, that would uh, be justification enough for the church to declare him the new divine uh, and that he would ascend to that. Now, obviously, with everything being suspicious as it is, it's very odd. At this point, orcs come up from the cellar and attack, and Duke Janus orders you as his Lord Protector to defend him. Now, regardless of what happens right here, it doesn't work out. So Duke Janus has to help in the fight, and he uses that as justification to say that you failed him as a Lord Protector, and you are a coward, and he promptly kicks you out of the castle instead of killing you, because this way, and more importantly, he can discredit you. Uh, It seems that he intentionally wants to rob people's idea of you, because in getting an invitation to Stormfist Castle, you've made a bit of a reputation for yourself. And it would appear he doesn't want that to happen. Now, throughout all of this, despite the fact that we were here looking for Zandalore, and we've asked about Zandalore several times, no one will help us. Now, as we get kicked out of the castle and we walk away a little bit, we will be prompted by his advisor from the castle, Lady Ilona, to, you know, we'll have a conversation with her, and it turns out that she's actually wicked and she throws you in a dungeon. Reveals that she's actually a member of the Black Ring and tries to kill you. Now, naturally, uh, that's not going to work for us. Now, this is where Arhu makes an appearance. Uh, We also met him inside the castle, by the way, for the first time. Makes an appearance and helps us escape this prison cell. And then from there, we have to escape uh, Elona's dungeon. And then Arhu, outside, explains that Zandalor has been trapped inside the castle by Duke Janus. He and the other marked one, that is. And then he leaves us to find a way into the castle to help rescue Zandalor. Now... We know that there's a way in through the sewers, and we're given two options at this point to basically either find the way back into Stormfist Castle through the sewers, or join the Thieves Guild in a town slightly north of where we are, and they will then show us where the entrance is, but that said, you don't really need to join the Thieves Guild, it's super easy to find this entrance into the castle in the sewers. There's only really one sewer, and you can just explore it till you find the entrance, like it's not difficult at all. So once we get back into the castle, it plays a short cutscene about uh, how the Black Ring has us all trapped. Uh, It's kind of a cutscene between a Death Knight and his master, and it's like, ha ha ha, we've trapped him and everything. And at this point, we see a little scene where Zandalore and the third marked one are trying to fight off all of these Death Knights from the Black Ring. Uh, Ultimately, the marked one is killed, and we do manage to rescue Zandalore, however. Now, Xandalore takes this opportunity to explain to us that he's looking for the Sword of Lies. The Sword of Lies, which he explains, is a sword created by a wizard during the earlier wars. So, a wizard named Ulthring joined the Damned, which is uh, the followers of Chaos, which is really just a, a sect of wizards that follow the Chaos God, and he forged a sword called the Sword of Lies under Chaos's direction. Now, this sword contains a tiny piece of the soul of Chaos, so obviously it's a really big deal. And Xandalore's here looking for it. Now, after rescuing Xandalore from these Death Knights and hearing all this, we actually go to the vault, which is nearby, to check for it. And in looking for it, we find that the sword is gone, but we do find a toy dragon there. And when we come back to Zandalore, we can show him this, and that's when everyone kind of pieces together what happened. 
after Duke Farrell died, uh, after bringing the Sword of Lies back from the battle that he was in, Janus uh, goes and down to this armory to play, grabs a hold of this sword, and the piece of chaos that's in the sword uses it to possess Janus and completely take control of him. So, from there, we have to escape, obviously. Now, Zandalore uses a little bit of wizardry to tell us, teleport us back to the Dwarven Bread Inn to make contact with the other marked one. It's down to just you two now. Now, upon arriving, we see a scene where ultimately this marked one is killed by the Black Ring. You and Zandalore discovering this uh, and finding out that you're the only marked one left uh, have to come up with a bit of a new plan. Zandalore teleports you both to the Council of Seven. Now, this is where the seven champions of the seven gods would meet and hold council thing is, it is infested with demons, because of course it is. So the succubus, the head demon here, traps Zandalore, and in order to free him, we obviously have to kill the succubus. So we take some time to clear out the Council of Seven, which frees Zandalore from his energy cage. And now that the holy site here has been purified of these demons, Zandalore takes you up to a room with seven orbs. Now. The old Council of Seven is long gone. Obviously, it's been hundreds and hundreds of years since this has been used. However, they left a method to determine the new council. The gods pick these council members regardless of whether or not the council members know it. So, all we have to do is pick up an orb, put it in the appropriate scrying place, and it will show us the gods' chosen council member now. Now, there are a total of seven of these. There are six for each race, and then one for the wizards, so collectively the seven races. So we have to find the council member for each of these. Now the good news is, one of them is already right here. Zandalore is the council member of wizards. So we're going to make the next part of this series finding these council members. So this is the second time gate in the game, in a way. So you have to stop, do some side quests, help uh, track down all these council members before the next part of the game can kick in. So like I said, this is kind of the second time gate of sorts that we run into. So there you go, guys. We're going to stop it right there. So we traveled from the Dwarven Bread Inn, did all this stuff with Janus, kind of found out what was really going on behind the scenes with all this stuff uh, that's causing problems out in the kingdom. And we now have the new task of restoring the Council of Seven so we can ascend to become the Divine One ourselves, as that is our fate as a Marked One, as Zandalor has previously explained. There you go, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you're looking forward to part three, please hit like, comment, subscribe, all that fun jazz, and I will see you guys for the next part. Have a good one. What's going on, everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you part three of the full story of Divine Divinity. So, last episode, we got into Stormfist Castle, kind of learned more about the broader plot of what's going on, and that, honestly, Janus is... Of course, possessed by the demon of, well, uh, the Lord of Chaos, whatever you want to call him, uh, basically the devil in this uh, particular world. What we have to do now is find the seven council members of the Council of Seven, as you might imagine, and convince them to come and perform the council ritual so we can rise to divinity and face this threat head on. By scrying into the orbs, as I mentioned last episode as well, uh, we can see who the current council member is, because the old ones have been dead for a while. So, starting off with the easiest one, the humans, we find out that the human council member is actually Mardanus from episode one. Now, this is why we want to go ahead and do the catacombs thing at the start of the game, because A, it'll kind of get you some stuff to get you moving and be a little better off as far as exploring goes, but also because Mardanus is this human council member. And if we haven't cured him of his insanity yet, he obviously can't join the council. So we have to do that part, and then when we're ready, go back to Alaroth, where Mardanus lives. And it turns out that uh, the town has been attacked by orcs, so we have to kill all of them, then kill their leader. I will fight their leader, she actually runs off. And then after that, uh, Mardanus comes out, uh, tells you how the... Well, you have to grab the key off this woman's corpse, then go unlock his door. And Mardanus kind of tells you how they attacked and everything. You ask him to join the council. Ta-da, you're done. So next up is 
the lizard guy is the one I like to do next. Uh, Go Gomo, I guess is how it's pronounced. So he is the lizard council member. Now this guy is also a healer in Alaroth. I don't believe I mentioned him up to this point, but. In order to recruit him to the Council of Seven, we have to have done the Send Aid to Rivertown quest. So Rivertown is, of course, uh, dealing with a plague issue at the moment that the healers of Alaroth are requested to help with. So we have to go to the barracks, which we did at the start of Episode 2, I believe, and send a military escort to Alaroth to get the healers to Rivertown. Now, once that's done, uh, all of the healers move into the Blue Boar Inn, which is just slightly north of Rivertown. Now, if we go there after this is done to talk to Gomo, we find out that he just left abruptly with a bunch of shady characters if we talk to the other healers there. And if you do some poking around, you can find out that he was taken to a town north of the dukedom called Verdistus. And if you do some poking around in Verdistus, you can find out that some strange characters just moved into an abandoned house there. Now, once you go in, you fight a bunch of thugs, uh, go down the stairs, you get frozen in place by another of the Lord of Chaos's minions. And while he leaves to fetch his master, Xandalor comes in, saves you from your freezing, and tells you that Gomo has been polymorphed into a lizard and you have to figure out how to deal with that. It's actually super easy. There's a wand of polymorph, you know in the next room. So you just pick that up, talk to the snake, and you can sort that out. Gomo switches back into a lizard, and you can ask him to join the Council of Seven. Ta-da, you're done with the lizards. And that brings us to the imps. So if we look at who the imp council member is, it's not somebody that we know, but we do recognize their surroundings as the Ducal Inn in Verdistus, which is the town we're already in, saving Gomo. So, we go to that inn, we talk to an imp, and unfortunately I can't show you all the footage for this because uh, this quest actually bugged on me, and it is a known bug that still sometimes happens. So, and by the way, keep like this is a fully patched game, this is the only bug that I actually ran into while playing with it, and it was a huge pain. So, in order to fix this bug, uh, which by the way the imp wouldn't talk to me at all, like I couldn't interact with him in any way, and then he just like randomly died. So I don't, I don't know what happened exactly. But that said, uh, I had to use a hex editor to go in, alter my save uh, data file. Um, if you don't know what a hex editor is, it just lets you uh, go in and alter like the actual binary code of a file. So I had to go in there, use that to alter my player position to the place that the imp in this inn teleports you to. Because the imp you actually need to talk to is not the imp in the inn. The imp you need to talk to is in this weird plane of existence that the imp in the inn is controlling. Uh, if you play Divinity Original Sin 2, you know that like pocket realms are a thing imps like to do. So, in this pocket realm, we find out that there's a huge battle going on between wasps and bees. Which is weird, but you have to pick a side, help, uh, you can kill everyone too if you want. It's very strange. But at the end of it, uh, you find the imp you're looking for. Ask him to join the council, and you're pretty well done. This was this was a strange one, to say the very least. And that brings us to the last of the easy ones, which is the orc council member. Now, if we scry the orc council member, we find that he is in a prison, uh, an orc prison, basically. So we may or may not know where this is at this point in the game. So when we needed to get an invitation to Stormfist Castle, which through the magic of videos I went ahead and skipped because it would have taken forever for the sake of seeing the main story. But it's one of the ways you can earn a invitation to the Stormfist Castle is by helping the army at the barracks. All you got to do is basically help them route the orc invasion that has been happening that you kind of get introduced to in Alaroth. And if you've done that, you've of course found the orc camp where these prisons are. And if you've done that, you can free an orc named Croxy. And all you gotta do is talk to him, like, freeing him is enough to get him to join the council, that's literally all you have to do. So, it's basically like, uh, if you haven't done this quest line, go do it kind of thing. So as long as you've done that, you're, you're done, that's all you gotta do. Uh, then you can talk to Croxy, ask him to join the council, and you're done. Now this brings us to the two more difficult ones to do. The Elfin Council Member and the Dwarven Council Member. Now, the Dwarven Council Member uh, actually won't be able to be scried until this point. Like, you, you can scry him, but nobody knows who he is or where he is. So, at this point, once you enter the Dark Forest, which is the second section of map in this open world, 
uh, you can actually scry him at that point, and it, you still won't know who he is, but you'll recognize the landmark behind him, or at least Zandalor will, and he'll tell you that it's the stone monument in Glenboris. Now, if we go down to Glenboris and talk to the dwarf in front of it that we immediately recognize by his distinctive clothing, we find out that his name is e Eolus, something like that. It's hard to pronounce for me. So we talk to him, and we find out that he will not join the council until the Axe of Stone is retrieved. It's just a dwarven artifact. Um, they believe that elves have stolen it, uh, which I alluded to er in the last video, actually, when I was talking about Janus instigating wars, and that the dwarves and elves are accusing each other of stealing each other's artifacts. So one of the artifacts for the dwarves that is missing is the Axe of Stone. Now, if we talk to Eolus, we can find out that they actually have a captive in town that they think stole it, that they found outside of town, passed out, and they're just trying to interrogate him to find out where he took the Axe of Stone. This is where this can actually go one of two ways, because at this point you can either go to the mayor and talk to him about seeing this prisoner, or you can actually go down south to the Dwarven King and speak to him about it, and he will then tell you more about the Axe of Stone, and it, it'll essentially send you back to the town to talk to this guy. But what you want to do is talk to the mayor, find out that he's a drunk, that's important, and then go talk to the elven prisoner after he gives you permission. After talking to the elven prisoner, you can find out that what he smelled before he was knocked out was rancid mead. And then you put two and two together and you're like, oh hey, the mayor's a drunk. So you realize that the mayor is at least involved in this in some way. So at this point, we have to go get him an ale and take it to him to, you know, butter him up, essentially, and get us to give us information. After we do this, the Dwarven Mayor will tell us that his new friends are helping him try to overthrow the Dwarven King, who's a guy he doesn't like. I guess it's his brother or something. From this, we find out that the people with the Axe of Stone that have enacted this plan are holed up in the mines in the Dwarven Halls, which is where the Dwarven King is. It's just like a mine section of the Dwarven homeland. So we go there, we plumb the depths of these mines, we come and find Mordanello, I guess is how you pronounce this guy's name. And it turns out that he has the Axe of Stone, so we fight and attack him until he runs away. And then we can find the Axe of Stone in the next room. And then once we've returned that axe to the king, by the way, that's probably the easiest way to do it, is just go to the king with it and give it back, and that solves that problem. And then we can go talk to Eolus, he'll join the Council of Seven, Ta-da, you've done one of the hard ones. Now that brings us to the last council member, which is the elf council member. Now when we scry this council member, it turns out that it is actually Bronthian, which you may or may not remember is the elf that came to Duke Janus's court to talk about the dwarves stealing their artifacts from episode two. So if you go down to the elven encampment in the dark forest, you can find Bronthian, who tells you that he's very honored that you asked him to join the Council of Seven, but he absolutely can't do it until he gets back the artifacts that were stolen by the dwarves. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's like the same thing for the dwarves, but in reverse. So, he sends us down south to the elven burial grounds, where we find that a bunch of dwarves are in fact destroying the elven burial grounds and stealing things. However, they're acting very strangely. So if you follow these uh, dwarves, they will lead you through an orc encampment down to a secret lair where you are immediately attacked by a bunch of mind-controlled dwarves and a woman named Josephina. By the way, just a quick side note, Josephina is the absolute hardest boss in this game. You have to fight her twice, uh, she teleports away after this, and then you kill her later on. Like, spoiler, I guess, on the game from 2002. I mention this because, oh my god, this woman is a nightmare. She is so difficult to fight. The first time, I was actually able to melee her down with some potions and stuff, but like, in the next episode, I'll get to just how ridiculous fighting this woman is. But anyway, after we... Well, we have to wind up killing the dwarves, actually. But once we get the elven artifacts back from Josephina, who happens to have all three of them that Bronthian sends you after, you can bring the artifacts back to Bronthian, who's like, oh my god, thank you, and then, you know, joins the council. Now, the most important part of this part of the story is the stuff that goes on between the dwarves and the elves. So, if you remember from the last episode, Duke Janus was trying to instigate a war between the two, on purpose, obviously. 
So by completing these two things, we stop that war from happening. We keep the dwarves and elves from going to war with each other by essentially proving that neither of them is responsible for stealing the other one's artifacts. Now, with that out of the way, we go back to Zandalore. Uh, we tell him that we have gathered the Council of Seven, yay, and that they can perform their ritual. So that is where we are going to leave off episode three. The next episode will be the final episode. Uh, it's it's a pain. I'm going to have to piece together a bunch of footage. Like It won't be like a super long time or anything. Like It won't be a long video. I just want to make it by itself. So I want to mention that right now, before this, after this part of the game, the game is... It's over for all intents and purposes. Like, it's not, like, really over, but from here to the end of the game is just one giant linear run. That, that's it. So, the last part is just going to be us wrapping up this video and the full story of Divine Divinity. So, there you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed what you see. Uh, if you have any questions, I mean, just let me know, I guess. Uh, any comments, anything like that down in the comment section below like comment subscribe do all of those youtube -y things consider joining blah 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 words thank you so much for watching have a great day what's going on everybody mortem here this time bringing you the final part in the full story of divine divinity and that story of course tells us how lucian became the divine as his uh well his most well-known role in divinity original sin 2 let's be honest this is the last part, um, last episode, we wrapped up with gathering all of the seven council members together and we stopped right before they performed the ritual to make us the divine. Now, as I mentioned in that episode, from this point, it is pretty much a straight shot to the end of the game, so there's really not that much going on. So, just to fill you in, they perform the ritual, they have to wait to summon you back from death because that's part of the ritual they have to basically sacrifice you and then the divines resurrect you is kind of how it works the gods that is so while they're waiting for the notice to summon you back basically janice comes in now at this point janice loses all pretense and completely sheds his 12 year old boy form and fully transforms into the demon of lies the demon of lies of course being the tiny fragment of the lord of chaos that was inside the sword of lies that the Lord of Chaos had forged so he could instill a piece of himself into it and use that to bring himself full-fledged into the world because the gods, through their sacrifice made before this game and seen off screen, had made it impossible for him to actually enter the world. All of that explained, the Lord of Chaos shows up, well, the, the Demon of Lies shows up, kills pretty much all of the council members we had just assembled after they performed the ritual, and then we get this awesome cutscene about us becoming the Divine. And then, after this happens, we wake up in the desert, with some orcs having an interesting conversation nearby. What becoming the divine actually means in game mechanics terms is you gain in the ballpark of around five to six levels instantaneously, basically, depending on, you know, your actual level. It's like a set amount of experience, but more or less it'll be around there. 
the orcs point us on the way to a village nearby that has been destroyed by the Black Ring. So, we of course follow that path down to that village, and who do we run into but Zandalor and Arhu. Now, Zandalor and Arhu explain that you have been gone for months. Like, several months. And in that time, the Demon of Lies has basically been rampaging across the Dukedom of Feral, and has just been uh, basically killing and causing general strife. Now, the human population and the elves were able to take refuge with the dwarves which saved some of them but like people are dying in droves right so Xandalor explains that you being the new awesome super powered divine should really probably go kill the demon of lies before he finally finishes uh, summoning in the actual lord of chaos so from here Xandalor tells us that in order to reach the black ring base which is on a lake to the east we are going to have to find a way to cross this lake that is instantaneous death. So it sounds to me a lot like the idea of death fog, but they hadn't actually cemented that idea yet. But basically, if you walk on the water over here, you die. So in order to get past that, you have to master a form of the divine called spirit form, which basically lets you turn into a ghost and travel without aggroing any monsters and taking any damage. Now you can do this one of two ways. One, you can go talk to the Patriarch, which is a black dragon nearby. Uh, he's largely considered the oldest and the leader of dragons in general, which is why he's called the Patriarch. And if you talk to him, he can teach you one rank of spirit form, or alternatively, you can take all of the skill points you just earned from becoming the divine and just manually put them into spirit form. Literally either of these works. So from here, the little desert area you're in, it basically just serves as a primer. If you need to uh, grind out a couple more levels, anything like that, uh, there's one person in the wrecked village that you got sent back to, which is actually the orc council member who managed to survive the attack as well as Zandalor. So you can use him as a merchant to buy more potions, anything you might need. And then it's pretty much just straight off to the Black Ring Island. From here, once we've spirit formed our way across the lake and gotten to the Black Ring hideout, it's basically just a dungeon run to the end of the game. The five Black Ring Elders that we have encountered throughout the rest of the game while gathering council members and doing various activities, you should have encountered five of them. And now you have to kill all of them to clear the way to the Demon of Lies. Most of them are fine, and this is where I'm going to mention that this is an old game and cheesing bosses is a thing. So some of them, if you have literally just one rank in Polymorph, you can Polymorph and that, that's it. Fight's over. They're Polymorphed. You can just beat them to death. Like they, they just run from you at that point. It's, it's hilarious. However, there are two bosses that you can't just instantaneously Polymorph, and that is Josefina and Iona. So Iona is not nearly as bad, so you can pretty much melee her down if you can't polymorph her. Josefina, as I mentioned in my last episode, is honestly harder than the last boss. She is a nightmare, which is funny because the boss, she was the last Black Ring Elder I beat. Going from her to the Demon of Lies is hilarious. Like, it's so easy. It's, it's just criminal, almost. She should have been the last boss. That is how difficult she was. So what makes her difficult? Well, I'll explain that. Just because I had so much uh, annoyance with her, I'm going to tell you all about it. So she opens up by summoning a death knight, casting a shield, and then casting blind on you before hitting you with AoE spells until you die. So here's the thing. The death knight is whatever. You can kill that pretty easily. The shield and the blind are the problem. So blind in this game means you can't even see your target to target them. You can't hit them because you literally can't see them to target them, which means they're unattackable. So to get around that, you basically have to use a stealth potion or run away until the effect runs off. Or that's pretty much it. You can stand there and get hit, I guess, if you want. But that's pretty much your only option at that point. The thing is, she's immune to the polymorph trick, at least in my experience. Uh, supposedly, you're supposed to be able to use this curse spell which lowers resistances and then you can polymorph her, but I spammed this curse and that never worked. So, I mean, I just don't see it happening. But how I finally wound up beating her was definitely some cheese. So when you first run up to her, there's about a two second window where she goes to cast her shield and the death knight. And if you hit her during that attack, like if your attack actually connects, it'll interrupt her. So what I wound up having to do is use this trap spell called a uh, summon scorpion or whatever, or like a trap scorpion. And I had like 11 of them, so I spawned all of them in, and 
They didn't do a lot of damage, but they were hitting her so quickly that she could never actually get her shield up or get the Death Knight summoned. The thing is, you know, at that point, you're just like, oh, you just used a scorpion. That's not necessarily cheesing, really. You're just using an ability. Yeah, but, you know, so when you use Curse, it actually freezes the target in place for like half a second through the cast animation. So in order to keep her from moving and even trying to use her shield, I just spammed Curse while these scorpions slowly stung her to death. <laughs> and that was how I basically cheesed this boss. So there you go. There's more information than you needed about Josephina. So after all these Black Ring Elders are finally dead, you can go fight the Demon of Lies, but of course not immediately. So you have to trek up his path in the dungeon, fight through a bunch of enemies to the Demon's Fortress, as it's called. Now it's kind of shaped in a weird bat-like situation where you have to go to the far left and the far right, or like the tip of the wings, to hit the levers to unlock the door to go fight the Demon of Lies. Now, while this is happening, it turns out that the Demon of Lies has completed his summoning. He has summoned the Lord of Chaos. That is to say that he has instilled the fragment from the Sword of Lies, which is basically him, more or less, into an infant. Now, we go in, we kill the actual Demon of Lies, but again, it's too late. The ritual has completed to summon the Lord of Chaos. So then we're given this pretty cool cutscene about whether or not Lucian decides to kill the baby or, you know, basically what goes on. So what we see here, at the time it was intended to be vague. So... You know, they didn't know if they were going to get to make another game, so they kind of left it open. You never actually see him take an action one way or the other with the baby. You never see him carry it out. You don't know if it's loot or the baby. You also see the Sword of Lies try to convince him to pick it up, basically, and then become possessed himself. He refuses, casting it back into Hell, which in this dimension is called Nemesis. And that's pretty much the end of the story right there, guys. So we managed to kill the Demon of Lies, but unfortunately he did succeed in his ultimate goal, which was, of course, summoning the Lord of Chaos. Now, he was able to put it in an infant child. So this child, uh, we know now, because obviously games have come out since then, becomes Damien, the Damned One. Lucian and Damien basically fight for a very, very long time. We know that story up to Divinity 2, which is actually the latest game in terms of the timeline. Uh, we know that Damien is still alive and Lucian is still alive. We'll have to see if Flarian ever decides to pick up where that end game, like the end of the series timeline. We'll have to see if they ever decide to pick that back up and carry on with the story. But this is it, guys. This is how Lucian became the Divine. So if you know him from Divinity Original Sin 2, there you go. You might have also heard about Damien or any of those in them. He's mentioned in some of the lore books. So basically from here, Lucian, uh, as we now know who he actually was, Lucian takes Damien, raises him as his own. That goes south, which I explain in my Divinity Series timeline video below. And there you go, guys. That's all I got for you. So there are going to be probably a couple more videos about Divine Divinity, just some stuff about like the recurring characters that show up later, kind of what this game brought to the series. And then lastly, I actually want to do a bit of a surprise video about who Alexander's mother might be, because he's not mentioned in any other game besides Divinity Original Sin 2. And this game actually gives a clue as to who I think that woman is supposed to be. So there you go, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video and the entire story of Divine Divinity. If you did, by all means, uh, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know all about it. Do what you got to do. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.